Greetings. Uh, I'm Keith Lewin. I work at the Centre for International Education at the University of Sussex and I have been directing the Consortium for Research on Educational Access, Transitions and Equity, otherwise known as CREATE, which is a DFID financed RPC. Today I'm going to talk about the problems that surround expanding access to secondary schooling in low income countries. And I want to cover three things. The first is to say something about why this is an important question. The second is to give you an insight into the status of secondary schooling in low-income countries, in particular in Sub-Saharan Africa. And the third thing I want to do is to look forward uh, as to kinds of key issues that there will be uh, as we consider the options on sustainable financing of expanded secondary schooling. So that is what we're going to do, and let me start then by making a few remarks about the rationale for expanded secondary schooling. The first reason I think it's very important to consider is simply that it really is a right and a commitment that every child should have access to a full cycle of basic education. What that now means is quite clear. It means at least until grade nine. In the discussions that surround post-2015 and the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, it's my guess uh, that the goals for 2030 in most countries will consist of 12 years of schooling for every child. This will be the aspiration of all but the poorest and most fragile states. That includes, therefore, secondary schooling, and secondary schooling access to it uh, will become, if it's not already, a right. So there is a promise. Uh, in many countries it already exists. In those countries where it doesn't exist, it will come to pass. So the second reason is that uh, because of the success of education for all, the number of children reaching the end of primary school successfully has been rising very rapidly. In some countries we've seen uh, as a, a doubling of numbers graduating from primary school in 10 years. This clearly creates a lot of additional demand for access to secondary school. And it is the case, of course, that if the transition rate from primary to secondary school uh, is not sustained, if it starts to fall sharply, then it's highly unlikely that um, it will be possible to, uni to universalise completion of primary schooling. The marginal child, the marginal household will simply give up if there's not much chance of going to secondary school. So that's the second reason. It really is uh, about supply and demand, in this case um, supply lagging demand in many low income countries. Thirdly, there are countries, and not just a few, which are post-conflict and fragile, uh, which have lost a generation of people in the middle, uh, that is a generation of young men and young women who, through circumstances probably outside their control, are simply not there. Or if they are there, their schooling was interrupted um, and they didn't have the benefit of attending primary school or secondary school. Uh, in those countries, secondary schooling may occupy a special role in terms of rebuilding a cadre and recreating capacity that's been lost. Uh, you, you could say, and it would be true in some circumstances, um, that this inverts the normal state of priorities where you might favour uh, primary school investment for all sorts of reasons over secondary schooling. Uh, clearly in a post-conflict situation where you need a civil administration, you need people in the middle level and you need an economy that works, the first thing you need rapidly are people who can occupy positions at the middle level who have access to abstract thinking skills and all that comes with effective secondary schooling. So uh, that seems to me to be um, Another reason why it's important to address questions of how to expand secondary schooling. Next, the competition for jobs uh, in Africa and in South Asia is increasing rapidly. And these, these are jobs in the modern sector. These are jobs that require educational qualifications. Um, and increasingly, there are jobs uh, that require secondary schooling. Uh, as primary schooling becomes more and more common, uh, the marginal rate of return on it of course drops because it's no longer scarce. Uh, but what is scarce are secondary school graduates of quality uh, who have completed uh, 9, 10 or even 12 years of schooling successfully and have mastered the learning outcomes associated with it, that level. But competition will be fierce um, and of course it's about competition between individuals for desirable roles uh, in the labour market. It's also about competition between countries. I think there's a lot of evidence that would suggest that foreign direct investment is more likely to go to countries which have greater human resources embedded in their 
population and crudely put that means more kids who completed secondary school successfully and got access to these higher thinking skills. Basic education is not enough and um, in the global competition between economies um, this will tell and clearly it already is. The final reasons, uh, I think there are three, that uh, make a compelling case for considered investment in expanded access to secondary schooling are these. Firstly, uh, demographic transition and improved health and well-being are very clearly correlated with the number of years that people spend in school. Uh, more educated mothers in most societies tend to have fewer children, uh, which can be a developmental asset. Uh, and they certainly are likely to have healthier children and they're also likely themselves to be um, less likely to be HIV seropositive and, and, and malnourished and, and many other things. So that case is overwhelming and really is not contested that uh, secondary schooling adds to a pattern uh, of increased well-being and health and nutrition for mothers, for fathers and for children. Poverty reduction of course does depend, at least in part, on social mobility. And if you don't have equitable access to secondary schooling, uh, then you won't have social mobility and you won't have sponsored social, social mobility, which will draw people from poor households into the mainstream. If no child from a rural area uh, ever made it through secondary school, then no child from that place will ever go to university. No child from that place is likely to be in a remunerative occupation where they can repatriate significant um, payments back to their hometown and so on. And the last reason I think that one would want to invite careful consideration of how best to expand access to secondary school is about social cohesion. It's about realising the commitments that pretty much all governments make to equality of educational opportunity. It's about providing public goods that do reach all citizens both because it's more efficient and because simply it's fairer. States that don't manage to do this sooner or later run into questions of legitimacy. It promises that are not kept to populations um, who have a right to expect what indeed states say they have a right to. So these are the rationales, I think, that lead us towards a case for expanded secondary school. I'm now going to move on to the next part of this talk, and say something about the status of secondary schooling in Sub-Saharan Africa. First of all, let me start by reminding people of the structure of school systems. We, I think, are all familiar, I'm sure, with the idea of primary and secondary school. In Africa, the most common length of primary schooling is six years, but there are a few countries where it's, uh, it's five years, and there are a few where it's seven and just one or two where it's eight. Clearly, these are choices, the length of the cycle. They're choices that come with costs of a financial kind, the longer the more expensive, uh, but there are also choices that come with implications for secondary school, the point at which selection takes place, the point at which there is transition from a primary school environment to a secondary school environment. Most countries in Africa and in South Asia do separate lower secondary schooling from upper secondary schooling. Again, the most common length of the cycle is three years lower and three years upper. But there's plenty of variation, 2-4, two, 4-2, four, four, two, um, and, and many other permutations. The choices that are made about where the break points are, where the transition points are, and the length of the cycle uh, clearly have the implications which are not only financial, but they're pe pedagogic. Um, and they, of course, have implications for the age at which people reach the end of the cycle. In those systems, which include many of the African education systems, there are large numbers of children who are overage. Any child that's more than two years overage and enters into a system uh, at the age of six or seven is unlikely to complete secondary schooling before they're 20 years old. Uh, if that's the case, of course, many will drop out uh, for all sorts of good reasons. Uh, being on schedule is very important, but it does have to do with the length of the cycle and how it's divided. I've said enough about structures. Let me move on to say something about the evolution of enrolments. You will see a chart in front of you which plots the gross enrolment rates at primary across a number of African countries uh, and the gross enrolment rates at lower and upper secondary. From that chart you will see immediately that there is no close correlation between the enrolment rates at primary and at lower or upper secondary. 
though the lower and upper secondary enrolments correlate with each other. What does this mean? Why is it significant? Well, the chart, amongst other things, shows the distance that some countries will have to travel if they are to provide universal access. If the current enrolment rate at secondary is only 20 or 30 percent, clearly uh, to have universal access would require three times as many school places, three times as many teachers, three times as many schools. The chart is showing um, that there is a policy choice about how much secondary schooling to have, which is not simply related uh, to wealth. It's a structural choice uh, and it may be influenced by other things, but it clearly varies greatly between countries. The next chart draws attention to how the enrolment rates have been changing over time. And you can see from the two lines uh, the difference between the enrolment rates in 1999 at lower secondary and the enrolment rates in 2010 at lower secondary. Again, the correlation between these two numbers is not very high, uh, but it does show very clearly that in almost all the countries, enrolment rates have indeed improved. And sometimes those enrolment rates have doubled or more. This creates a lot of stress on these systems, particularly stress to maintain quality in a period of rapid expansion. And it invites some reflections about the distance to travel in the future to reach levels of enrolment that are near universal. Um, and the kind of conditions that may be necessary to manage that expansion in a way which doesn't degrade quality. I now move on to my third chart. This chart shows enrolments, and these are not enrolment rates, these are absolute numbers of enrolments, in four different countries uh, over the last 10 years. And they give a picture of how primary and secondary school enrolments have been evolving. They provide a very stark and very obvious reminder that different countries in Africa and elsewhere have very different patterns. Ethiopia, the number of children entering into grade one has doubled over this time period. And although there clearly is still a lot of attrition and dropout through grade one to grade 12, uh, it's quite clear that enrolments at the higher level have increased dramatically as well. The dotted line running across that chart shows you the number of children in the age group the equivalent to the grade. And you can see in Ethiopia there is a tipping point around grade three, grade four, where there are more children in the age group than there are enrolled. That, in some sense, is a measure of the gap left to travel to reach full primary enrolment and full lower secondary or upper secondary enrolment. If we look at the chart in Tanzania, we see a very different pattern, a pattern in which it's clear um, a transformation has taken place where children entering grade one are by and large remaining in the system to at least grade seven. So what used to be a high rate of dropout beyond grade one um, has indeed uh, diminished and it rather does look as though in Tanzania almost all children are reaching grade seven, above which there are more children in the population than there are in the school system. So there is a challenge for secondary expansion in Tanzania because the ratio between those graduating from the primary school system and children who are admitted to secondary school clearly um, is quite a large one. Malawi is strikingly different. In Malawi, over the last 10 years, the number of children entering the system and graduating from primary and seeking secondary school entrance in grade nine has not changed very much. The increases have been modest. The dropout rates across the system have remained very high. We can contrast that uh, with the fourth case in Ghana, where very clearly enrolments by grade through to grade nine, the end of JSS, uh, have increased uh, considerably and now approach the number of children in the age group, though there is still some shortfall. But in Ghana, rather like in Tanzania, there is a very steep transition to upper secondary school, uh, where most children, in fact, do not make the transition. This is a challenge for the future, and it's a challenge to make that selection fairer and perhaps to ensure that it has greater predictive validity than it may do at the moment. So that gives a fairly good picture of some of the changes that have been taking place and some of the challenges that will confront systems that seek to universalise access. The two charts that you can see in front of you now take low enrolment countries in Africa 
and demonstrate how far there is a need to travel from current enrolment rates uh, at secondary level above grade six to reach the age cohort size. There's a good news story about girls' enrolment at secondary school in Africa as well, which we should remember. The chart which you can now see shows that where the blue line is greater than the red line, there, are, um, uh, there has been a, an a change in the GPI, the Gender Participation Index, in favour of boys. Uh, where the red line is greater than the blue line, uh, the change has been in favour of girls. And you can see that in pretty much three quarters of the countries, uh, the relative position of girls has improved in relation to boys. And if you want to elaborate on that a bit, it is important to realise that these aggregate figures conceal within them many different patterns across different countries. The problem of girls' access to secondary schooling in Africa is not one problem. It comes in many different forms in different places. The four charts you see in front of you group countries in Africa into four different cases. In the first case is a pattern where from grade one it's generally true that there are more boys in secondary school than there are girls. And in some of those cases, uh, by grade nine or grade ten, the proportion of girls in the system is down to uh, not much more than 35%. Uh, we can compare that with the chart to the right of your screen, uh, which shows that through the primary school grades, um, the GPI is between 45% and 50% indicating that there are a few more boys but not a lot more. But above grade six there's a clear falling off in the secondary grades where the transition rate uh, uh, is greater for boys and the dropout rate for girls may be greater than it is for boys. So the proportion of girls diminishes. In the third group of countries in the bottom quadrant you can see that throughout grade 1 to 9, and even in some of the countries up to grade 12, there are pretty much as many girls as boys. These are typically higher enrolment countries, but not all. Some of them are low enrolment countries. And in the last group of countries, which are high enrolment countries, almost invariably uh, above uh, the primary grades, there are more girls enrolled than boys. So there are different stories to tell, different problems to address, and different patterns to appreciate uh, when designing interventions which are intended to promote gender equity in secondary school. I come to my last two charts. These are charts which really illustrate how far we have to travel, not in enrolment terms, but in terms of equity. This first chart distributes participation by household income in different countries in Africa. I pick out, by way of example, Sierra Leone. In this household-based sample, the poorest children and the richest children have dramatically different chances of being enrolled. Those in the poorest quintile are much less likely to be in secondary school than those in the richest quintile. The difference uh, is a factor of 10 to 1 or more in terms of the probability of being there. And we can see similar differences in the next chart by region. I take just for one example uh, Tanzania. In Tanzania, uh, if you're in Mbeya, you have a much smaller chance of being in the secondary school than you would be in Town West. So let me finish then with my third set of issues and bring this to a conclusion. There are about 10 things that I think are worth considering systematically as representing the main challenges that confront expanded secondary schooling in Africa, which is sustainable, which is financially sustainable, and which contributes to greater equity. The first is the challenge of planning and manage expansion in ways which doesn't undermine quality and which promotes valued learning outcomes. This is easy to say, but we now have considerable experience of what has happened when some primary school systems have expanded very rapidly, quality has been degraded and learning outcomes have become less than satisfactory. There's no need to repeat the same mistakes that perhaps were made 
in the last two decades. Second, secondary schooling in Africa and South Asia is often expensive. It can be between four and six times as much per child to deliver them primary schooling. At those kind of cost ratios, it is impossible to universalise it. Well, rich countries spend less than twice as much on a secondary school child as a primary school child, and that must be a goal for sustainable financing. Third, universalising access to secondary schooling will require new approaches, particularly to the development of small secondary schools, which can offer a full range of curriculum. It will also require some break on the size of large secondary schools, which may be in high demand but can enrol several thousand students and therefore become very different institutions than, an inst than a secondary school where all the staff know each other and all the children's names are known. Fourth, secondary schooling is highly regressively financed at the moment and is inhabited mostly by children from richer quintile households. This has to change. There are other things that have to change as well. Obviously, gender equity is a goal. And so is increasing the people, or the chances of people from the rural areas um, and uh, townships experiencing secondary schooling. We should not forget also, of course, that disability and membership of particular social groups is often a factor which causes exclusion from secondary schooling. All these things have to be addressed in different ways in different countries. Fifth, there is a striking challenge for expanded access to secondary schooling at a curriculum and pedagogic level. Moving from systems which historically recruited 10 or 20 percent of an age group to systems that recruit 90 or 100 percent means embracing the needs and wants of children who are characteristically different from those who have survived selection tests in the past. It means addressing the needs of the whole, whole range of capability in the population rather than the, the children who have been selected for their academic capability. This is a challenge. It's not an easy one to solve, but it's essential if attempts to expand secondary schooling are not to fail, uh, not only for reasons on the supply side, but also for reasons on the demand side. Older children do have agency and one of the main reasons given by secondary school dropouts for leaving school is lack of relevance. These questions therefore have to be addressed. Another key issue that we need to address is training and deploying a sufficient number of new teachers efficiently and effectively. We need to address questions about how to attract the best students into secondary school teaching. This will mean competing for graduates with other occupations we need also to ensure that new teachers are deployed efficiently and effectively, that class sizes are controlled within reasonable limits, and that there are sufficient incentives to ensure that teachers do spend an adequate amount of time on task. Twice as many children could go to school in Africa for the same cost if school management ensured that teachers in African secondary schools spend as much time on task as they do in OECD countries. Other things which are essential to expanded secondary schooling are to make much more use of formative assessment, which can diagnose learning problems, which can identify misconceptions and which can help identify the most effective pedagogies. This needs to happen at school level, and of course it can happen at levels above the school. It should be coupled with reform of high stakes selection tests which are used to manage the transition from primary to secondary school, from lower secondary to upper secondary. It is important that those high stakes assessments promote learning goals which include higher level cognitive capabilities. It is important that they have predictive validity and it is important that selection where it takes place is equitable and does not favour some groups over others for reasons unrelated to their capability. Lastly, and related to that, our needs to invest in constructive monitoring and inspection systems of schools that can manage growth 
in a way which does meet the challenge of maintaining quality whilst extending the reach of systems which historically have been for el selected elites to the mass of the people. This seems to me to be the set of issues that lie at the core of new policy which is needed to address how secondary school systems will expand. Thank you.